Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of the iOS Lead Essentials podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Kayo. And in this episode, we will be discussing about testing challenges. So, if you've been following us for a while, you know that we recommend that you test your code. Not just write tests, but we recommend you follow test-driven development and you write the test first. Exactly. And you probably faced a bunch of code that was hard to test. You were trying to write the test first, or you're trying to write tests, but sometimes you cannot do it. Yeah. Maybe because you're dealing with legacy code, meaning code that was built with no testability in mind, there are no tests at all, or you're dealing with third-party frameworks or infrastructure details like mm-hmm. network, databases, things that are unreliable. Exactly, and out of your control. And you may also feel stuck wondering if you've tested your code enough or if you tested it too much. Right. (laughs) So today we're going to reply to questions regarding those common challenges when writing automated tests. So question number one. How can I know I have exhaustively tested a method? For example, a method that checks if a number is even or not. I can test a couple of values, like 1, 2, 3, 4, but how can I guarantee that it works for every even number? Right. Or having a function that validates an email. How can I be sure the regular expression is right? Right. That it works for every email? Well, you can't ever check for every possible output. That's it. The answer is that you can't. You simply can't. (laughs) But you don't need to. Exactly. You don't need to test every possible outcome. You need just enough evidence, enough samples to prove that your function does what it's expected. Yeah. So yes, there are cases that you can have an infinite number of outputs. You just cannot test every combination. And you shouldn't test all combinations. That's not the goal of testing. Yes. Testing is not about proving. Yes. A hundred percent. There's no way. Software is not provable. Right. Or not a hundred percent provable. There are too many things involved. There's hardware in the middle as well that can fail. But all you need to test is enough samples to give you the confidence that it works. Mm -hmm. Make sense? That's it. So here's what Azamat, one of our students, said in the Slack community. You cannot test all variations, but you can test a slice of all variations. And of course, corner cases is a must. That's why programming is not like math, but more like science. I like this quote. Yeah, well said. Because you cannot absolutely prove every variation in software. They are infinite variations, where you can produce enough evidence to demonstrate that it is correct, to give you confidence that it is correct. So if you want to check a function that verifies if a number is even or not, you don't need to run every possible integer, which is infinite. Yes. Just enough samples for you to know that it works. How many? I don't know, for a function that checks even or not, maybe three, four samples is enough? Not that many, exactly. Not that many, not that many. For email, there are a lot of corner cases, edge cases that you need to handle. Yeah. So I would add more samples. And if at some point there is a bug, you find a bug in the email validation, you add a new sample to the test. Exactly. Makes sense. So software is not provable 100% because there are infinite outcomes. But you can use mathematics or mathematics concepts to make your code better. You can make your code more robust by following math concepts. So, for example, some types, like enums, Mm -hmm. they can help you better design your domain. So you can prevent your code getting into wrong states. And not every language has enums, like Swift does, where you can hold associated values. Yeah. 
So that's a big help from the type system and the compiler. Exactly. So you can make illegal states unrepresentable. Yeah. So well-defined types make illegal states unrepresentable, which means it can reduce the number of tests you need to write because you don't need to test illegal states because you can never represent them. Yep. Makes sense? You get the best of both worlds. You get the testing where you test the behavior and then you get the safeguards provided by the compiler that just doesn't allow you to provide specific types and specific values for those types. It's fantastic. That's it. You can use the type system to help you test your code. Because if you cannot represent a state, you don't need to test that state. Exactly. So, we recommend you pay a lot of attention to your software design, defining good types. And we also recommend that you test enough samples to give you confidence. But you don't need to test every possible combination. Yes. But triangulate with corner cases to make sure that you're covering not every output, but the behavior. That's it. And there are techniques and frameworks that can help you create enough samples because creating those samples by hand or by memory, yes. maybe that's not a good idea because there will be some corner cases you might miss. So there are techniques, for example, property-based testing. And there are frameworks too, which generates the values for you. You define the properties you expect from your method, from your implementation, and the framework will create samples for you and validate if the properties hold. So that's something you can do. So you don't need to create the samples by hand. Next question. How to test random values without mocking the random algorithm? Yes, you don't need to mock the algorithm. In fact, you should be free to change the algorithm without breaking the tests. Yes. As long as the new algorithm holds the expectations and properties you need, that's it. You should be able to change the algorithm without breaking the tests, without having to mock it, without having to inject it. Yeah. For a specific input, you should expect a specific output. So again, you can use property-based testing. Mm -hmm. So you will run your algorithm a couple of times to collect samples, and then you can assert the properties you expect from the random samples. For example, there should be no collisions. You can run your algorithm, I don't know, a thousand times, a hundred times, and check that there are no collisions and that there is a good spread between the random values. Mm -hmm. So it depends what kind of properties you expect from your random algorithm. You just need to define the properties and test it. You don't even need a framework to do that. You can literally just run your algorithm a couple of times and check or assert what you expect. No collisions, for example. Otherwise, you need to mock it. Next question. How to test code that asynchronously dispatches work to the main dispatch queue? For example, after fetching some data in the background, I need to dispatch the main queue to update the UI in my view controller. I am mocking the service that fetches the data, so I can control when the data is returned. Yes. Should I also mock the dispatch queue? Ideally, no. I don't like mocking dispatch queue because threading is an infrastructure detail. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like to have threading everywhere in my code base. Right. So ideally, no. Instead, I will move the threading logic away from the view controller. Yeah. I will move threading to the composition root, to a centralized place. Because the view controller is a UI element, and you expect UI calls on the main thread. Yes. So you should never call a method on a view controller in a background thread. That's a violation of the contract with the UI. That's it. So whoever creates the view controller or the UI will also be responsible for dispatching in the main queue. That's it. 
and who creates the instances? Ideally, the composition root, which is the place that knows about the concrete types, and it's the place that knows if it needs to dispatch or not, depending on the composition. Because the thing is, most of those async dispatch to the main queue is defensive, right? You are afraid that a service may complete uh -huh. on the background queue, and that would crash your app. Mm -hmm. So defensively, you put dispatch async everywhere in your code or in the UI. Yes. And that works. You prevent the crashes, but it can also lead to bugs because something should happen synchronously, but it happens asynchronously. Right. Or sometimes you are capturing the view controller instance with self inside the dispatch main queue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the view controller gets off the screen before the dispatch main queue right. block is executed. And this can also lead to crashes. So no, defensively dispatching to the main queue usually leads to more trouble. Yeah. So ideally, I will move the threading away from the view controller and just respect the contract that UI should always be invoked on the main queue. And you move yeah. that dispatch to a centralized place in a concrete place. Exactly. You only have to remember to dispatch in the main queue once when you create it. That's it. So if a service complete on the background queue because of, I don't know, network or a database, which is infrastructure detail, then it's up to the composition route to dispatch to the main queue. But you might be dealing with a service that already dispatches on the main queue mm. or already runs synchronously on the main queue like an in-memory cache. Right. So in this case, there is no need to dispatch again. But if you're making this decision in the UI, you will always go into dispatch, even when you don't need it. Exactly. So the key is the UI shouldn't know about the provenance of the data. Yep. When you dispatch to the main queue in the UI layer, you are leaking some details about the service. You are leaking threading details. And that complicates a lot complicates testing, complicates development and debugging as well. As we said, it leads to issues. So the UI shouldn't know about the provenance of the data. That's the dependency inversion principle, right? Yeah. High level modules shouldn't depend on low level details. They should both depend on abstractions or not depend on each other at all. Yeah. That's how you can add new features without changing existing code, by the way. Exactly. The open closed principle. That's the open closed principle. That's it. In combination with the dependency inversion principle. And we explain this in detail, including the code in a YouTube video with the title Testing Code that uses dispatch queue main async. Check it out. Next question. I need to test a function that generates a date span but I end up with a lot of duplication. My test code is a copy paste of the production code. So how can I test code that depends on the current date and time? So what is the problem? The problem is that every time you instantiate a date instance with the default initializer, you always get a value that is different because time never stops. Exactly. <laughs> That's the problem. Creating a date is an impure operation. Because remember, a pure function always returns the same output for the same given input. But an impure function may not. Like date. Every time you create a date, it's a different value. And that's why it's common to see tests that are copy and paste from production. Mm -hmm. Because if you create an impure date in production, you need to also create an impure date in the test side so they are in sync. Yeah. Especially when the test is written after the fact. Yes. So you just copy the production code into the test target, run the test, and it passes. Ooh, fantastic. But now you have duplication. Yeah. What are you actually testing? If you have a bug in production, you're going to have the bug in the test target because they match. They are the same code. That's it. And that's the issue. But there is a better way. 
every time you're dealing with impure operations, like current time, or the network, or the database, what do you do? You replace them, you replace this impure dependency with a predictable one. So instead of creating the date inside of your class, you can inject the current date into the class. Mm -hmm. Or you can even inject a date provider that could be a protocol or a closure. Yeah. So you make the current date predictable because during tests, you always pass the same precise date. So you don't need to duplicate code in the test target. You just test the behavior. Exactly. So you control the date. And if you control the date, you have a point of reference so you can perform all the operations that you need there. Yes, just like when you control the network or you control the database. Yeah, yeah. It, it's exactly the same concept. I know it's maybe it's hard to grasp, but it's exactly the same thing. You have a dependency, in this case it's date, or the network or a database, and you want your component to collaborate with this dependency. What do you do? Dependency injection. That's it. Because most of the times, when you're dealing with code that is hard to test, it's because this code is creating the dependencies implicitly. Yes. Inside the implementation. Yes. Instead of requesting the dependencies it needs to run the operation. So that's the key. Inject the impure operations so you can control them during tests and in production as well. It's going to make your design better and more testable at the same time. We also published a video explaining this in detail with code. The title is Testing Date Span in Swift. Controlling the current date and time. Check it out. It's on YouTube. Next question. How to test if a UI text field is focused? Mm. I can check is first responder in unit tests because I'm calling become first responder, but is first responder always returns false. All right. So that's a common problem. If you just create a text field and you call become first responder, it will not become the first responder unless it's in a window hierarchy. So there's a, an implicit dependency on UI window that is not very clear. Yeah. That's why the tests don't pass. So your view needs to be in a window hierarchy. Otherwise, you will not become the first responder during tests. So just add your view to a window, any window. It doesn't have even to be the key window. Mm -hmm. Just instantiate a UI window, add your view as a sub view in the window, and then run your code. Now, if you verify, his first responder should be true. That's it. We showed this technique in the iOS dev mentoring number eight, test-driven MVVM with RX Swift. Check it out. I think it's in the last 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I believe it was at the end of the lecture. Next question. I'm trying to unit test a simple logging view controller with a few text fields and one logging button. So probably username, password, yeah. and button. The UX goal is to ensure that when the keyboard shows, the keyboard will not block the login button. So it's not going to be on top of the right. login button. I'm adding the view in a UI window and calling become first responder on my text field to programmatically fire a keyboard did show notification, but it doesn't work. How can I fire the keyboard did show notification during tests? Okay, so in this case, you don't need to add the text field in a UI window or call become first responder to fire the notification. If you want to fire a keyboard did show notification, you can just use the notification center directly. Mm -hmm. So just call post on your notification center instance, passing the keyboard did show notification and the user info and the object and whatever dependencies you need to pass to verify right. your code. It's much simpler. You know? Yeah. 
because you can also pass the keyboard frame in the user info of the notification. So you have a constant frame during tests that will validate your logic. Because if you don't, you will rely on the simulator frame, which changes depending on the simulator, depending on the simulator size, which would make your tests less reliable. Because imagine if you run on an iPhone 6s simulator and then you run on iPhone right. 8 right. plus. Yep. They have different frames. You might break your test and you want your test to run on any simulator and pass. Exactly. So you call post on your notification center instance and you pass the right notification. In your case, you want the keyboard did show notification and you pass the user info dictionary with the frame you want to use in your tests. That's it. So you don't rely on simulator frames. And it's also much easier to set up. You don't need to create a window. You don't yeah. need to invoke become first responder. You know, all those dependencies, you don't need them. Just fire the notification directly and verify the behavior you expect. That's it. Next question. How to test parts of the app that uses Firebase? Well, ideally, you shouldn't, right? <laughs> Just need to make sure that your components collaborate properly with any Firebase components. But that's it. Like Firebase is, is tested. By Google. Yeah, exactly. Or that's, it should have been tested by Google. It, yeah, that's probably better <laughs> to say. Yeah, they don't need to test Firebase. It's a third-party framework that should have been tested by their creators or collaborators. Yeah. You just need to test that you're using it correctly. Yeah. But I get it, you know, because let's say if someone follows the documentation, usually, right? Mm -hmm. There is tight coupling between the Firebase code and let's say a view controller, which is the UI, right? And of course, this is for demo purposes. Right. But then if you start adding more complexity in your app and let's say you forget the Firebase code in your UI, then yeah, this uh, this view controller is going to grow and it's going gonna, it's gonna to become more complex, more hard to test, or even impossible to test. Right. So you're saying that if you go to the Firebase documentation, you will see some demo code that is using Firebase like a single tone directly on a view controller. Yeah. And it's not just Firebase. It's like most third-party frameworks, I would say. Yes. And again, because of demo purposes, it's not something these these folks are doing wrong, you know. <laughs> so this is important. If you're following documentation, you shouldn't copy and paste code from the documentation, right? And expect that to be their main recommendation right. how you should use the framework. It's just a simple demonstration, right? You need to get a framework and find a way to accommodate it into your design in a clean way. Yes. You shouldn't just literally copy and paste code from documentation because that's demo code. Yes, exactly. It was probably not intended to be used like that. So point number one, you don't need to test Firebase. It's been tested already. Point number two, just test how you're using Firebase. Make sure you're using it correctly. Not that Firebase works because it should work. Yeah. And don't copy paste code from documentation. <laughs> Right. And how do you test that you are using Firebase correctly? That you're sending the right messages to it? Yeah, you can create a protocol and create this dependency inversion between your components and the Firebase components. That's very important in the first place, right? Because Firebase, as we said, is a third party framework. You don't want your code to depend directly on Firebase. So it's not just a testing strategy. Exactly. It's a design strategy to hide Firebase or any other framework from your app logic. Yeah. You shouldn't depend directly on frameworks, so you can replace them more easily. And as a bonus, you gain testability as well. That's it. You don't add protocols only for testability. Actually, the main purpose 
is to protect your logic, your application from frameworks. Because frameworks are volatile. Yeah. So this is key, what you're saying here. It's the design decision that led to the ease of testing in this case, right? And this is predominantly what, what happens if you, if, you, if you make good design decisions. <laughs> the code is just going to be testable. It's going to be very easy to test. And it's going to be very easy to change. That's it. And if you're dealing with a legacy code base that is using Firebase singletones everywhere, there are other strategies they are not ideal. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you should have a well-designed system. But if you're dealing with legacy code, you can use Firebase emulators, which are local servers that will run on your machine. So they're more reliable than making actual network requests. Mm -hmm. So during tests, you can talk to a local host rather than with the real Firebase server. But you need to install a bunch of frameworks on your machine, on your CI server as well, to make sure that you can run those emulators. So it works, but it's not ideal. Right. But it might be a step that you need to take until you improve the design of your app. Make sense? Yeah. So if you absolutely need it, you can use emulators or just make the request to the server and deal with the end-to-end <laughs> -end complications. You know? lack of connectivity or server issues. Right. Which will make your test slow yep. and unreliable. But it could be a step until you can improve your design. Yeah. Exactly. Next question. How to test store kit? So the framework for making in-app purchases. Mm -hmm. It's an Apple framework. Well, we received this question many times. And until Xcode 11, you could only actually test the framework by actually making in-app purchases. Right. You know, going through the App Store Connect and creating sandbox environments and all that complication. Or put everything behind protocols, which was right. not ideal as well. Yeah. To hide all store kit behind protocols. Because you end up with a bunch of code that is only there for testing purposes. Yeah. And that complicates the design. A bunch of dead code in production. But those were the main options we had before. However, WWDC 2020, Xcode 12 now brings finally ways for you to test store kit integration with in app purchases. So in Xcode 12, you can more easily and reliably test store kit with automated tests. You can manage products and transactions directly within Xcode. And you can write unit or UI tests yeah. using the new store kit test framework. Fantastic. That's something we were missing. And now it's here. Now you can easily test in-app purchases. Exactly. And let's hope that this is going to be the beginning of a trend. Perhaps other frameworks are going to have the test counterpart in the next years. I'm sure it will. I'm hopeful. Yeah, one can only hope here, right? <laughs> so with the StarKit test framework, you can test or simulate successful purchases, failed purchases, interrupted purchases, subscriptions, everything. Right. If you want to learn more, just check out the WWDC session Introducing StarKit Testing in Nextcode. Mm -hmm. That's it. Next question. How to test sign-in with Apple? So this, this would be a good candidate for what we just said, by the way, if we had like a sign-in with Apple test framework. Yes, different than StarKit. We don't have testing facilities for signing with Apple yet. Yes. I believe they will provide us in the future, like they did with StarKit, but we don't have it yet. But the idea, just like we talked about Firebase, mm -hmm. is not to test the framework directly. Yeah. Because signing with Apple has been tested by Apple already. So you don't need to test it again. You just need to test that you are using the framework correctly. That's the same topic over and over. Don't test third-party frameworks. 
Yes. They should work. If they don't work, you should probably not use them. <laughs> yes. Find a better one. Exactly. But that's not the case with sending with Apple. It works. It's been tested by Apple. So just test that you are using the framework correctly. How? Read the documentation and write the tests to make sure that you're following the instructions how to use the framework. For example, you need to create the proper requests with the proper scope and you also need to implement the delegate methods to handle the results. And you can learn all of that in the documentation. Right. And then you just need to implement your code following the guidelines, the instructions. And you can test first. You can write the tests to make sure you're following the instructions. So you can read the instructions and write unit tests and then make the pass one by one. But it's not that easy. <laughs> it's not that easy because we have limited control over the framework. All right. For example, there are some classes in the framework that we cannot instantiate. The initializer is unavailable. Right. For example, the AES authorization, which is a result we get back in the delegate method with the credentials and all the details you need. So since this class that you cannot instantiate is passed to the delegate, it's a parameter in the delegate method. Right. You cannot invoke the delegate method during tests because you cannot instantiate a mandatory parameter in the delegate method. So you cannot test your implementation of the delegate. Yeah. That's a problem. So solutions. One. UI tests. Right. <laughs> you actually going to press buttons on the screen and see what happens. Yeah. It works. It's a solution. <laughs> what are the problems? Well, I mean, compared to unit tests, this test is going to be extremely expensive, meaning it's going to take a lot of time and you risk it to be flaky as well. Why flaky? Because you're going to hit the network because there are processes that you cannot control while it's running. And you also need to have an Apple ID. <laughs> right in your simulator yeah. and it needs to be in the right authorization state you know there's a bunch of setup that is not easy to create yeah and all of this can break at any point for reasons you have no control over exactly <laughs> so those would be flaky tests but it's a way of testing ui tests i don't like it i don't use it but it is a solution that is out there and endorsed by apple even so that's why it's here yep solution number two using objective c <laughs> wait let me let me explain <laughs> so in swift we cannot create those classes because the initializers are unavailable but signing with apple the whole authentication service framework is in objective c right which means you can create an objective c wrapper to instantiate the classes for you. That works. Because in Objective-C, you can do whatever you want. You can use <laughs> method swizzling. You can create a proxy. You know, there are things you can do. You can swizzle the whole framework to spy on the behavior or to replace behavior. And you can use frameworks for that. For example, OC Mokito. Mm -hmm. It's a framework that with one line of code, you would have an instance, a mock of an AS authorization class, for example, that you cannot create easily in Swift. So if you're happy to you have some Objective-C code in your code base, that's a solution as well. And if you're happy with OC Mokito, do some swizzling, some proxying, that works as well. But that's a trade-off, right? Because we would prefer not to mock framework behavior. Yeah. Because you need to make too many assumptions about a framework to mock it. Yes, exactly. Ideally, you don't want to do that. But this may be a solution for you. If you're happy with the trade-offs, use Objective-C. But there's another solution in pure Swift. When you cannot invoke a method during tests, you move the logic to another method 
you can invoke. Right. Simple as that. So in this case, you cannot call the delegate methods because you cannot instantiate some of the parameters. No problem. Create a new method that you can invoke and make the delegate method forward the message to the new method that you can invoke. So you don't need to test the delegate method directly. It's just a simple method that forwards a message to another one. And you just call the method you can invoke. Again, it's not ideal, but we are dealing with third-party frameworks that we have no control. So nothing would be ideal here. Yeah. You need to wage the trade-offs. If you don't want to use Objective-C, if you don't want UI tests, if you want pure Swift, that's a solution. Yeah. Move the logic to a method you can invoke. That's it. Now, this is how to test the delegate methods. What about testing that we are performing the right requests with the framework? That we are passing the right scopes, the nonce, that we are calling the right methods in the authorization controller? Well, you can test it by injecting the authorization controller. Right. That's it. Because again, it's hard to test code that creates its own dependencies. If your code creates the authorization controller, sets it up, and calls the methods, you won't be able to test it. Yeah, not in Swift, at least. Well, you could, but you would require a lot of hacking. Right. <laughs> and you don't want a lot of hacking. Yeah. So what do you do? You just inject a authentication controller, so then you can investigate or you can verify the behavior in the tests. So this is going to improve your design, and it's probably the best approach if you think about productivity, because you don't need to mock anything. You don't need to have external frameworks for mocking anything. Yeah. You literally create an instance, pass it in, check the behavior. Pure Swift. And you can test drive the whole implementation as well. Yeah. And it's going to take a lot less time to develop and a lot less time to run the tests. Less than a second. Yes. <laughs> 0 0.001 second. Exactly. All right, next question. How to test a UI image view of a UI table view cell that fetches an image from a URL using SD web image? Mm. Okay, SD web image is also a third party framework. Right. They add some extensions to UI image view. So you can easily fetch images from a URL. So again, it's a framework and you shouldn't test the framework because the framework has been tested already, right? So the question is, what are you trying to test? What do you want to test? Yeah. What do you really want to test? <laughs> <laughs> the image view is tested as the web image is tested. So what are you trying to achieve here? So if you're trying to test that you're passing the right URL to this method, that can be a valid test because you're testing how your code uses the framework. Yeah. Right? And one solution is to add some protocols in between. But then again, hiding your UI image view behind a protocol may be, I don't know, maybe not the best solution. I don't like it. You are in the UI layer, communicating with your views, and you're going to add a protocol in between just so you can test some external framework. So ideally, those frameworks should provide you some facilities for testing, mm -hmm. right? You should have a way of injecting or stubbing some behavior with the framework so you can easily test it. So I recommend you find frameworks that give you those facilities. But if you're dealing with a framework that doesn't have that, well, maybe you don't even need to test that you're passing the right URL because, again, the SD web image has been tested already and your code is just passing a parameter. You need to wait the cost benefit of adding protocols to be able to test. If you're just passing a parameter to a framework that has been tested, I would probably not test it unless I have facilities that the framework provide me for testing the behavior. And frameworks should provide those facilities for you. If they don't, I wouldn't use the framework. Right. That's it. And if I have to use the framework for whatever reason, 
I will probably not test it because the framework has been tested and I'm just passing a parameter to it. Check out the humble object pattern. That's going to clarify things. Yeah. Next question. I have an alert control with a shared instance to present alerts in my app. How to test that the alert control shared instance displays the alert on certain events? For example, when some event occurs in my view controller. Right. Okay, so looks like the view controller is accessing the alert control shared instance directly. Yeah. So that's the singleton pattern. Yeah. You have an implicit dependency to a singleton inside your view controller. That's it. So one way you could test that is that instead of having your view controller accessing the shared instance directly, you should inject an instance of your alert control. So during tests, you can inject a spy, for example. So you can check that the view controller is using the collaborator correctly. So you test the behavior rather than actually checking that a model was presented in the view hierarchy. So your test is much faster and you're just checking the behavior. You don't actually need the whole UI running on a simulator, for example. So don't access shared instances directly. There's nothing wrong with a singleton when you want to have only one instance of an object. The problem is when you access the shared instance directly everywhere. Yeah. Instead, inject it so you have a better design and a more testable design as well. Next question. How to test that a component is storing values in user default correctly? Well, you can just invoke the method in your component and query the user defaults instance in your test. Right. And you check if the value in the user defaults matches the expected value. That's it. If not, it's a failing test. Sounds like a very simple option, but yeah, that's exactly right. It's a key value store. So if a key exists, you're going to get a value. That's it. And back in the day, we used to mock the user right. default right. because it was quite slow. But with SSDs nowadays, it's pretty fast. You know, the storage yeah. is pretty fast. It's pretty performant. So you don't even need to mock it anymore. You can, right? You can mock it, but you don't need it. You can just pass a real user defaults instance to your component. And after you invoke the behavior, you verify that the value was stored in the user defaults. But avoid using the standard user defaults instance, the shared one, the singleton one. Because again, it's shared state, which means if you're running tests in parallel, you could have race conditions. Also, every time you run the test, you change the shared state, shared state that is shared with production. The production environment uses the same standard shared instance. So there may be the case where the test affects the production code or the production code affecting test result right. and tests affecting other tests, which is not ideal because you can have unexpected failures or race conditions when running tests. What do you do instead? Instantiate a test-specific user default with a custom suite name so you don't share that instance with any other tests or with production. Right. It's test-specific. You use it during the tests, then you erase it. Don't forget to erase it in teardown. Otherwise, the state will be kept the next time you run the test. And that's not ideal as well. Every time you run the test, it should be in a clean state. Yeah, and sometimes you want to hide user defaults uh, behind the protocol, not just for testing purposes, but for dependency inversion purposes, right? Because you don't want your component to depend directly on a specific storing mechanism like user defaults. So, in this case, maybe you can hide it behind a protocol and then have user defaults implement that protocol 
right? So we invert mm-hmm. the dependency there. Right. And then you can provide different implementations. You can have a keychain store implementation. You can have a new memory store implementation, yeah. whatever your application needs. Exactly. And during tests, you can use a spy or a stub. Yeah. Exactly. Or a fake. Whatever works for your use case. That's it. All right. Those were all the questions we have for today. If you want to learn more, if you want to learn a better way of building iOS apps and increase your earning power, visit us at academy.essentialdeveloper.com. This is going to do it for this edition of the iOS Lead Essentials podcast. Let us know your thoughts, your comment, your feedback. We'll see you again next time. Bye, y'all. See ya.